Okay, I think we'll get started. There probably will be some more people coming in as we start. So I'm Jill Wyatt. Um, I'm the chair of Exeter Community Energy. I'd like to welcome you all to this event, to the big community energy weekend. And, um, and it's my privilege to thank and welcome um, ben Bradshaw to open the Big Community Energy Weekend and ECO's launch. So, Ben. Jill, um, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. Um, I have been wondering for quite a long time why something like this hadn't happened in Exeter. Um, given that we have the birthplace of the transition movement just down the road in Tottenham, and given that we have a lot of people in Exeter who um, are quite rightly very concerned about environmental issues, uh, energy, energy security, climate change. So um, when Jill first came to see me, uh, I was very encouraging, um, and I, I will remain very encouraging, because one of the things that I am growingly worried about at the moment is that um, there's a fight back going on on, uh, on climate change, on energy policy, uh, that the consensus that uh, we thought we'd built up uh, uh, on this being the biggest single challenge that humankind uh, faces uh, is um, shattering. Um, it's being campaigned against by extremely powerful and well-funded uh, organisations, many of them with fossil fuel interests, uh, with a lot of friends in the media. Um, in my view, and I don't want this to be a party political event, I'm, it, it, it's extremely concerning to me that one of the main parties that could win the next election is increasingly adopting policies which are anti-renewable energy, um, include moratoria on, on, wind, on wind, onshore wind, uh, and we are nowhere near at the moment where we need to be uh, on meeting our climate change targets, our, our uh, um, um, CO2 reduction uh, targets. And any of you who have any international experience at all will know uh, how, how far behind uh, we are. So I think it requires a renewed drive, particularly in the city that is the home of the Met Office, which has provided so much, so much of the undeniable science on this that we should be the ones who are helping to drive this uh, locally. Um, I also think what's brilliant about uh, community energy projects like this is that um, you have the capacity to draw people in who otherwise might not have got involved, might not have had their consciousness raised. Um, and you also have the potential to provide multiple benefits, uh, not just benefits of, along the lines that I've talked about in terms of uh, our climate change and CO2 reduction uh, targets, but um, energy affordability, energy security, um, energy and fuel poverty. Um, everything that you're proposing to do here is a win, 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 win on all of those uh, areas and has the capacity to draw uh, members of the public in who, let's face it, in the current and recent economic climate for whom uh, when they're struggling to make ends meet uh, sometimes these issues are not at, at the forefront of their agenda and their concerns so I think we have to have a renewed effort um, to rebuild the consensus around uh, climate change and make sure that the pressure is on people like me uh, decision makers and policy makers uh, elsewhere uh, that this needs to happen and it needs to be done and um, projects like this uh, can only be massively beneficial for that. So I'd like to congratulate you for having got this off the ground uh, and all of those who I know have helped you a lot um, because it's, it's a voluntary initiative. Uh, people are giving of their time uh, to do it. Uh, it's fantastic it's happening in Exeter and I hope that you succeed in going from strength to strength. I look forward to working with you to make sure that happens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ben. And and just want to say that there are eight of us that make up Exeter Community Energy. So I may be the chair, but every one of the directors have helped to make to get us to the point that we've got today. One thing I would like to say, because some of you were probably expecting this to be the community share offer launch, we had hoped 
that this event would coincide with our community share launch. But it's taken us a lot longer to find roofs for people to sign up on. And so hopefully that will happen later in the summer. I said to Ben just before we started that we're talking to people and you'll hear more about this from other people in the presentation. It only takes one organisation to say yes and we've got 200 kilowatts worth of PV and we can go. So it's, it's like, you'll hear more about that. I won't say more now. <laughs> so, so extra community energy, it's, uh, we're a community benefit society. Um, that's just a type of non-profit organisation. Um, our vision is for community owned renewable energy projects to address the energy challenges that we're currently facing. And I think Ben's mentioned many of those. It's, it's the increasing um, climate instability. There's our addiction to carbon-based um, fossil fuels. Um, we, we don't, a, a lot of us don't think about the energy that we're using. We're struggling with rising energy prices and those people on low incomes are moving ever more um, severely into fuel poverty. And community energy and Exeter community energy is wanting to address those challenges. And the more projects that we get off the ground, the more impact that we will have. And so there is the, there is the potential in community energy projects to change the way we produce, use, and think about energy. Once the community owns its own energy, renewable energy uh, regeneration, it means that you start thinking differently about your use of energy. Not only do you become an active party in the community, in the ownership and in the decision making process, but how you use it, you think in a different way. Thanks. I've probably gone on and said some of the things that are on my next slide. No, okay. So the overview, how is Solar PV1, our first project, going to work? Initially, we're looking well, we have to find suitable roofs. We're choosing roofs rather than ground mounted because we think it offends less people. There's mixed response to the idea of ground mounted solar. We may do ground mounted solar later on a suitably hidden from view site, but for our first project, we want to use roofs. We then raised our investment through a community share offer. That means that anybody in our local community can invest money and partly own the project. We will maybe take from else from further afield, but again, I'm, talking, I'm giving too much detail. I'm, I'm meant to be doing the overview. So with the investment, we install the solar PVs and we start generating renewable energy and, of course, income. And that income is through the government fit and the power purpose agreement with the owner of the building. With that income, that income becomes what's sometimes called a revolving fund. So the money pays a fair rate of interest, but it also is used for establishing a community fund for more energy efficiency projects, and then also for reinvestment. So money makes more money. It's like a mushroom effect. <coughs> Community energy, the government has recognised that communities can be as Governments and communities need to work together. That is what community energy is trying to do. So that's a quote from the community energy strategy that came out in January of this year. And the benefits, I think I've probably mentioned, I think between Ben and I, we've already mentioned the benefits that are up there. So this is what the potential of community, community energy has and what Exeter Community Energy is trying to do. So our roots are from Transition Exeter, and I'd like to hand over to Jill Westcott to tell you a bit more of our origins and the role of Transition Exeter. <laughs> That's our team. <laughs> let's have a look at them again, hey? Well, they're beautiful faces. <laughs> Transition Exeter, as many of you know, is a community response, originally to peak oil and climate change. And uh, what we face now is a situation, 
certainly of uh, greater urgency about climate change, as, as Ben pointed out. Um, it now appears that there is plenty of fossil fuels in the ground. If we burn it, the climate, we're on to the six degree path, um, which makes what we're doing uh, even more urgent. So, but we certainly expect rising energy prices. So our original uh, impetus is continuing, but with a greater awareness of social justice and the growing inequalities that we have as well. And the aim is to uh, enable a transition to a low carbon society and it, in which other people have, in which everyone has a better life. It is possible to have a better life without economic growth as we know it, which involves greater material throughput, but which involves uh, improving well-being. So Transition Exeter, uh, here it says, we can't rely on oil forever. Might it be a good idea to plan what we're going to do instead? <laughs> on yes. the right is... Um, to the audience, I think, <laughs> an earlier Green Homes tour, and obviously many of you will have a chance to do that later. At the bottom are signs of where the transition movement has migrated to. There are over 900 transition initiatives, towns, peninsulas, islands, forests, and villages in, in the world, and many more um, like similar initiatives. So um, we're fostering these kind of um, initiatives, and it's a thing that depends on community energy. Next slide, please. Which is why we have five working groups, but they're often different groups from the ones that we had last year. At the moment we have um, two projects. This one, which has evolved from the energy group, and the uh, food group has evolved the real food store uh, in Paris Street. And the other working groups are Transport, who have just brought out a vision for Transport in Exeter 2030. Anything much more to say more? Uh, the economics group that is looking at ways in which we can have an, an economy which is compatible with sustainable society. Um, and we have transition families, um, which also does green walks and um, involves things that are um, suitable for all ages. So these are the other things, some of the other things we have. We do public meetings <coughs> usually once a month. And on the Transition Exeter store, you'll see our next two ones are about emergency and disaster preparedness, and in June, about working towards a fair and sustainable economy. We usually have quite a bit of discussion to draw on the creative genius of our members. If you'd like to know more or sign up for details, there is a place to do that next door. Thank you. My name is Heather and I'm the Secretary of Exeter Community Energy. Um, I'm also a mechanical engineer who works for a hydropower company. Um, my two main interests are renewable energy and co-ops, so I'm very pleased to be working in Exeter Community Energy. Um, so I'm going to talk about our, the cooperative structure and our governance. We, as Jill mentioned, we're registered as an IPS Bencom, and that means we're a cooperative for community benefit. And you can see the definition of a cooperative up here. If it's not very clear, I'll just tell you that it, a cooperative is an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. Um, so when we registered, then um, that includes is our primary rules. Um, they are like registered with the FCA, and that sets out our aims and like the legal framework in which we work. Um, so in the last few months, then we have been we've been developing our governance um, and how. So governance is like the living systems and processes that informs our policies and procedures. It shapes our direction and provides accountability. So it goes a bit further than our primary rules. We're sort of, you know, we're, we're going beyond what just the, the legal fr framework sets out, like how we actually do things. Um, so we have developed some principles of governance. Um, um, they are that we are a learning organisation, um, 
um, that we encourage participation by the wider community um, and that we operate democratically. Um, we are community-led, in fact, and we seek equality, diversity and openness. Um, we have a commitment to accountability. Um, we prefer to make decisions by consensus where possible. Um, and where that isn't possible, then we make majority decisions. So in our in our rules, it says that like we have to make make them make them by voting democratically um, as like the minimum level of democraticness. But we hope to take it further than that and use consensus. And that's what we do in our directors' meetings. Um, <laughs> um, and Yet, so, um, we think that financial viability and economic soundness are vital so we can be effective and efficient um, and we can realise our aims. So we hope to be like a functioning business. Um, so from our principles of governance, then we've been working on our secondary rules, which is, um, which is more of a working document than our primary rules and it like, puts into practice all of these principles of governance um, and it outlines uh, the structures and roles and responsibilities that we use. Um, and one of the, like, the structures that we've developed is working groups. So now it's not just the, the directors who are like organizing the organization, it's also working groups focusing on different topics. Um, we invite you all to take part in our working groups that are open to anyone, whether you're a member or not, like at the minute because we haven't had a share offer, we don't really have members yet. Um, but even when we do have our share offer, anyone anyone can get involved with the working groups. Okay, and now finish. Hi everybody, um, I'm Griff. Um, I'm one of the directors of Eco as well. Um, I guess you could describe me as an environmentalist and a concerned citizen. Um, I have a background in uh, electronics and renewables development. Uh, and I came to this project to just be involved with the community and, and sort of lend my hand and see what I can do. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about PV1, uh, Solar PV1, which is going to be our first project. So uh, some of the details of that. Uh, right, so uh, we've heard of the roof, roof lease. Uh, idea. Um, that was something that came out quite early on in uh, the PV industry in the UK. Um, and it was kind of a maligned idea, but it works really, really well with larger scale sort of commercial projects. Um, some, of the, some of the domestic players didn't quite work so well, but on, on our scale, it's a really, really good model. Um, so in, in that scenario, um, we would own, or uh, Eco would own the, the equipment on the roof and there would be a, a site who would be a host to us uh, and we would make a, a leasing arrangement with them uh, over a 25 year or 20 year period. Um, and in that agreement there would be things like a power purchase agreement and a mechanism for them to get their benefits, uh, a mechanism for us to secure our access to the roof, etc. Um, this is all going to be funded uh, through the community share offer, which we, we talked briefly about there. Um, and that's, that's a mechanism where uh, individual people can, can buy a, a share, um, range from one pound. Uh, minimum share uh, purchase, we want that to be around 50 pounds, maybe 200 pounds, but a bit of, bit of negotiation on what we mean by our minimum share offer. Um, but the idea of that mechanism is that everybody in the community can actually take ownership for a PV project uh, and start to make benefit from it for themselves and for the community. Um, the site, uh, the host, um, our gracious host, will benefit greatly from, from the, the PV equipment being installed in their, their facility. Um, initially, the, in the, the big one is that they're going to be re reduced energy costs. So through the, the power purchase agreement, they will be able to buy energy from us from the, the PV panels at a reduced rate. So it will be less than they will be buying from the grid for naturally. Um, so there's a significant benefit for them. But also there will be community engagement, community involvement. Um, it will be a, an, an opportunity to, to bring together people uh, to sort of focus on, on, on their, their activity. Um, and 
the solar panels are one of the things that they do really nicely. Obviously, is they generate electricity. Uh, the site benefits from the reduced energy costs, but that returns revenue to eco. Um, and then with that money, we're able to um, aggregate that with the, the subsidy from the government, um, and that is then uh, able to generate our internal funds for our potential other projects, uh, community energy funds, where we, we will be implementing some sort of project within the community, but not necessarily renewable energy projects, it might be an energy efficiency project, it might be a training project, but it will be not, not intending to generate more re revenue, that will be just benefit to the community. So that is the basics of uh, this model. Um, site selection, pretty important. Um, we obviously would lo like uh, a large amount of roof space um, on, a, on a nice, easily accessed site. Um, so we're looking at that at the moment. We've, we've got some, some uh, iron, irons in the fire, um, but we haven't got anything tied up quite yet. Um, so if anybody knows of a, a nice roof that's south facing generally, I guess probably 300 square meters and above in, in service area would be lovely. Um, so uh, it's a bit more detail about the revenue. Um, so that returns to the, uh, the shareholders um, in a sort of a, a balance between the shareholder and the community fund. Um, so as a shareholder, you, you want to get your, your, your return. Um, and further energy projects. So. As I say, that might mean those other community things. So um, the the launch hopefully will be later this year for the other share offer, and we're we're looking to uh, achieve 200, 300k's worth of, of capital, um, which EK will then be able to deploy either on one site or numerous sites um, to achieve a, an installed capacity of roughly uh, 100 kilowatts. But 200 kilowatts. Oh, okay. Well, um, so targets are increasing, um, but it all, all depends on how much money we're able to raise, really, and how many sites become available. But these are the sort of strategic level we're looking at. Um, obviously, we want to give priority to local people, so uh, Devon residents, uh, Exeter residents, etc. Uh, um, so the community share is slightly different from an ordinary share. Uh, in the sense that um, it's non-transferable. So if I bought a share in, I don't know, company X, normally I would be able to sell that on the market and potentially make a, uh, a, re a reward. But with a community share, they are, I, I buy them, um, I hold them, and then I can return them to Eco. I can't transfer them to somebody else. So there's a slightly different mechanism there. Um, also, um, we need to have a minimum shareholding. Um, we've discussed there between 50 and 200 pounds. Um, there's also the possibility that the, uh, the share will reduce in value, um, but it won't actually increase in value. So unlike, and that doesn't sound very good, um, <laughs> but uh, it's, 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 not, it's not a share that is designed to be traded. That's the idea. It's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a trading mechanism. Um, so that's why the, the value is, is, is capped the way it is. Um, and recently, the uh, maximum shareholding was extended uh, to, to 100 grand from 20 grand previously um, in the, uh, the government's most recent uh, community share strategy document. So that's showing uh, that the government is, is wanting to extend the ability of community projects. Uh, so benefits, uh, roughly a 4% return. Um, that's a nice rough figure. Uh, we wouldn't want to guarantee that. Um, we can't actually legally guarantee that. Um, but that's our, our target. Um, if you look at the performance of, of PV generally out there in the market, um, it, it looks to achieve sort of an 11% uh, IRR. So if we were taking that as a, as a general idea, a 4% return to the investment, <coughs> some money probably a similar 4%-ish to the community fund, a bit of contingency, that's a sensible, sensible figure. Um, so uh, uh, also there's a, a tax relief mechanism. Um, 30% tax relief for, for your investment um, with projects of this nature, which is which is quite nice. And also generating a community fund. And I, I've said that several times, but it's actually a really, really nice thing. And um, there are many investment opportunities that will uh, give you a nice, shiny community project at the end of it. So that's pretty, pretty nice. Um, is that in my slide? That's okay. in my slide. So I will hand you over now to my colleague, uh, Gabriel. I'm Gabriel von Grouch, uh, uh, direct 
directors of uh, Pico, and I'm just going to talk to you a little bit more about the roofs, uh, essentially what we're kind of looking for in a roof, what roof is uh, going to you know, sort of give, give us the best um, benefits back to the community and then give you a bit of an update of where we are so far. So essentially the better the roof, the more income the solar panels will make and the more benefit we can, we can put back into one, back to the shareholders but also back into the community. So the, the, um, the good generation potential, basically that takes into a con in consideration the orientation, the angle of the roof, um, the geographical location, which we find we're down in the southwest, so it's a very a, a, a fantastic uh, place for it. Um, and essentially the sort of installation costs, the higher the installation costs, then essentially the lower the return on the capital that you put into it. So um, once you have sort of, sort of put all that together and you, you're sort of looking for the sort of ideal roof, you then need to look at also the, uh, the, the owner-occupier of that building. Because part of the, the system is that we're selling the energy generated from that system back to the occupier of the building, the higher that occupier's energy usage, the better, because the more of the energy they're going to buy, again, more revenue back to the community scheme. Um, we, the, the, the main difficulty with, with finding roofs is essentially getting the owner of the roof to, to, to sort of sign the, the lease benefit is to allow us to basically have ownership and access to the roof of, above their building, um, and that that's generally the sort of main sort of hurdle hurdle for getting these um, projects through. So we are talking with um, you know a, a, a number of different people, which I'll come on to. Oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we'll come on to. Okay, so effectively, there's there's a couple of different ways of approaching. The, the community benefit. So there's basically the, the direct benefit where um, we can install a system onto a community building and the community building will then do, um, benefit directly from having lower energy bills, from having lower um, um, carbon emissions and, and it also sort of acts as a kind of hub and people definitely sort of feel the benefit just from uh, that interaction with renewable energy. What ten what you tend to find with the community buildings is the financial benefits for eco are lower because generally the roofs aren't as big as what we're looking for so the, the cost per watt of the installation is higher but also their energy usage is, is lower so the amount of the, the, the amount that we can essentially charge with the energy, the energy they use is also lower so what you find is the installation costs slightly higher and the, the, the return slightly lower, but the community benefit is felt directly where the PV is installed. The other option and the other alternative is to go and then basically install it on a large commercial building. So that's where you will find we have the lowest installation costs and generally the highest energy usage. So therefore, for every pound of the, that's generated from the community share offer, we get more investment back into the community scheme. So the actual PV panels themselves aren't really doing a great deal for the community because they're benefiting a, a large organisation, but then the income derived is higher, which we can then put into the community fund, which then has that direct community benefit. So there's there's two options that we're we're looking at, and we are exploring both areas, and you know we, we I'll give you an update on where we are with a few of those. But those are the two kind of areas that we have to weigh up, because if we go down the direct community benefit route, it means that the funds are a lot lower that we put that community benefit and the other route. People may say, why am I investing in a system that's going on a big corporate building, and, you know, but the funds are greater. So, so that's the kind of juggling act we're playing. Um, so these are lots of organisations that we're talking to, and one of the, the fantastic things about working with a, a community energy group is, is it opens doors. You know, I've, I've worked for Sun Gift Solar, so we've been in this industry for many years, and getting to talk to, to big organisations is always very difficult. Um, community energy groups, everybody um, is very willing to talk when um, you, you sort of mention there's a community benefit involved. And so it opens lots of doors. So a lot of these organisations we've been talking with you know, have access to you know, most of the roofs, a huge amount of roofs um, within you know, Exeter and Devon. Um, the difficulty of it is quite a lot of these, um, um, the, the, the actual owners of the roofs and the decision makers um, can be quite far removed and sometimes only sort of look at things in black and white. And so 
there's one thing that generally people who own buildings don't like, and that's leases. They don't, if they own a building, they don't like to then lease a part of it. Even though we're not leasing the building, we're leasing the roof space above their building, it is a legal document that sits with the land registry that gives us that access. So <coughs> we have a huge amount of irons in the fire, a lot of people we're talking with, and we are, we're, we're due to have our first one signed up, I think, extremely shortly, which is, is um, a community centre, which is fantastic. It's not the, the, the size that we're after for our, you know, our first project, but it's the first one that we're, we're, we're closest to signing up, and because it has that direct community benefit, we're, we're very excited and very happy with that. And there'll be lots of, um, yeah, so 20 kilowatts. Um, Devon County Council have been fantastic. We've, we've got um, a contact, I haven't seen him here, Doug's not here today, do you know? No. no. Uh, he's been brilliant, someone from Devon County Council has, has been helping with the working groups and, and sort of um, helping sort of sort of put some rules our way. Um, but until we actually have the people, the decision makers who are willing to sign those leases, it's very difficult. We, we, you know, there, there's potential megawatts of capacity that we've looked at, and so we only need a very small fraction of them to actually sign that lease, and that allows us to, to, to proceed and, and get some systems up there. So it's all very exciting. There's, you know, there, there's lots of different areas um, that we're looking at, but what I would kind of urge everyone is if you know of any potential, if you know someone who may be interested in hosting a site where who uses a lot of energy, that would be looking at you know, having a community benefit system on their roof that could lower their energy bills, please let us know. We'd be, be very happy to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Joe Smee, and I'm also one of the directors of Exeter Community Energy. Um, I wanted to talk to you mainly about what we plan to do with the organisation in the future, but before we can do that, we kind of need to understand where we've come from. So this is a little timeline of our road to uh, solar PV1. Um, as Jill Westcott was saying earlier, Transition X to Energy Group originally started looking at a hydro project on the River X, um, which was kind of around the kitchen table kind of an operation, people meeting once a month, lots of expert people, but obviously it takes a long time and a lot of feasibility studies and there's a lot of organisational and land challenges with the hydro project which made it a very difficult thing to progress. So from that, they developed the idea that we would look to progress a solar project. This is kind of in the early part of last year. And around about the same time, myself and some of the other current directors joined the board, and that's when we finalised our um, board of directors. We've got a lot of expert knowledge and a lot of relevant experience. Um, and then, yeah, in the kind of autumn of last year, we were lucky enough to receive some, a generous donation from a member of Transition Exeter. And that has essentially paid for Jill and I to be employed part-time on the project. Um, we actually put in a lot more time than we paid for, but <laughs> that's not a great. That's just to recognise that all of the other directors of Exeter at Community Energy also put in their own time, and, and a lot of other people too. Um, a lot of these strands which I'm going to talk about actually run th throughout the timeline. I've just placed them there to get a look at <laughs> So funding has come from other places as well at other times. Um, the first... The first kind of step when we were trying to develop the project was to really understand the market, understand what community energy was and how it works. So we spent a lot of time talking to other community energy organisations. There's a lot of like, rich experience there which we can uh, draw on. Um, we needed to, uh, we went to conferences and we did a lot of research into the way it works and that fed into our plan for solar PV1. Um, we began talking to a lot of roof owners as Gabriel was just describing before. And that obviously runs right through this strand as well. At the beginning of January this year, we were formed legally as an IPS, as Hertha was describing. Um, we had a soft launch event in February um, at Stephen Scowing Solicitors. Uh, that was a really useful event for us because obviously we had a kind of skeleton plan of what our project was going to be for. And we came and presented that to around 70 or 80 people. Um, we took a lot of really interesting ideas and feedback from people. A lot of this presentation today has been based on the questions and the feedback that we've had since then. We formed um, a few working groups, as Hertha was describing, mainly around finding roofs, organising the governance, and organising uh, this weekend's event. And there's been active participation in those, which has been great. Hertha has been describing already that we've been developing a governance structure and that's been a lot of work and a lot of thought and effort gone into actually kind of making sure that the processes are fit and proper for actually delivering the kind of the principles which we, which we want to pursue. Um, financial model has been 
a lot of work. Um, basically, we don't have a finance expert on our board. Uh, it's kind of probably maybe a, a brave admission to make in front of a room full of potential investors. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we have got a financial model which we've developed with the assistance of the Cooperative Assistance Network. Um, what that does is give us a general idea of uh, what size project will give us what kind of return, how much it will give to shareholders, um, how our cash flow will work, and how much money we can deliver into a community fund. But what we need to do is, um, once we've got a portfolio of roofs finalised, we need to work on that model to make sure that it's specific to each of those roofs and that it's, and that it's kind of accurately projecting what our financial um, progress is going to be over the next following 20 years. So that's a lot of work done and to be done. Um, the business plan and kind of developing first ideas of our share offer, um, that's something else which we've been kind of working away with and all of that work which has happened over the last year or so is fed into. And that takes us up today, which is the big community energy weekend. Uh, there's lots of stuff going on this weekend and it's been um, a lot of organisational work to do it. Jill will kind of give you some more details about that in a minute. So that's the past and um, this is the future. I'm just going to put these all up so I don't have to stand here. <laughs> so, um, once we've actually delivered solar PV1, we've got, we've got a vision for what happens in the future beyond that. And that, that is basically about creating a new local energy market. Um, we've heard a lot about, obviously, the community fund and um, participation by the community in that one project. And that's kind of one side of it, one very important side of it. But the important thing for us is actually to start thinking about and start even delivering a, a whole new local energy market. Um, why do we want to do that? It's because the current market is inefficient in that it, lots of energy is lost. It's produced miles away from where it's used and a lot of it is lost in transmission. Um, it's polluting obviously because it relies heavily on burning fossil fuels and despite progress in renewables there is a lot to do if we are going to meet carbon targets both locally and globally. Um, but the big thing for, for me personally anyway is that it's drastically unfair. Uh, Exeter spends approximately £70 million a year on energy and most of that money, in fact mostly all of it, leaves our community and ends up as profits for big six energy companies. Nearly 11% of homes in Exeter are in fuel poverty. So those kind of two figures work together and make me think that we need something different and it needs to work differently. So we want to keep as much of that £70 million in our community as possible. How are we going to do that and what is this energy market going to look like? First of all, more renewable projects based on the model of solar PV1. We can start doing that in the next two, three, five years, and we will. Um, we'll look into more technologies, and we'll aim that to grow the organisation so we can produce more and more renewable energy. And obviously that is going to help us reduce emissions locally and globally. Um, we'll create a community fund that will use money from our projects and it will not only go back to shareholders, but into uh, ways of making the whole of Exeter more energy efficient. Um, and that will help people in fuel poverty especially, and covering the same ground again and again here, so I'll move on. Um, but yeah, it's all about also creating a new local economy, and the energy market feeds into that. So we want to work with other local businesses to create a more resilient local economy, um, and set an example of cooperative action to others yeah, in areas including energy and others. Um, and the big one really is can we set down a challenge for the big six? That's a bit of, might seem a bit of a silly thing to say in a room of 30 people, but basically the, the energy market is changing and is going to change. It's not just us in this room who recognise that there is change needed. You know, there's the government community energy strategy. Um, Ofgem are obviously launching a two year investigation, I think, into the way the energy market operates. The energy, the energy companies themselves, executives, accept that the big six dominance of the energy market is not going to carry on as it is and we're in for a radical change and how that, how that happens and what happens next is up for debate and we need to be a part of that debate. This is some other groups around the country who have done um, similar things and uh, really inspiring things around the country um, similar to what we want to do um, and the important point is that basically we are not alone. Um, there are people all over the country trying to do this and creating this uh, kind of centre for ideas about what happens next in the UK's energy scene and how big a part of that is community energy. Um, 
but exactly how that takes shape and what happens is up to all of us. So if we can work it out together, that would be great. <laughs>
that community ownership, people being able to be active in their community, it can turn around some of the alienation and the apathy. You know, I mean, the percentage of people who probably will vote next week is very low, and if, if people were more engaged, then I think we'd be more active um, politically. And in a way, that's one of the advantages. You know, there are social benefits, there are economic benefits, and there are political benefits for community energy. So an organization that wanted, who had that large thinking, the thinking out of the box, then they are part of the cutting edge, rather than in the aesthetic and the establishment um, norm. Yeah. Hi, a uh, question for Ben actually. Uh, you said you wanted uh, more pressure, you're getting it. W were you aware that yesterday two very high powered local ladies um, stood up at this conference at Exeter University and uh, they're trying to change the rules of engagement? If I can just quickly quote from Catherine Mitchell, who's a professor of energy policy at Exeter University. Uh, one, she has very little faith in any governments, and two, we really need a completely new way of thinking about this, she said, which she was referring to UK energy policy. So, uh, oh, were you aware of that? Uh, can you do anything along well, those lines? I'm aware of the concern. I, 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 I'm afraid, I have to say, though, that people who say that they have no faith in government is a council of despair, because the only way, uh, apart from grassroots and, and uh, pressure and, and organisations like this, that we're going to get change, particularly internationally, mm -hmm. uh, is through global agreements. And I think we made quite a lot of progress uh, on that under the Labour government. I'm afraid that's stalled now. I don't think there's a political will internationally. Indeed. There's not the leadership that we saw, uh, that we had before, and we have to rebuild that. Um, so uh, you know, the fact is that the legislation around our uh, carbon reduction targets, the Climate Change Act, was passed by a government. Mm -hmm. And that is a very important part of, of achieving change. So I think if you kind of write off uh, the ability of politics or government to achieve anything, we might as well all give up and go home. And that actually, Catherine did make a comment in her speech, but then a question came at, at a very similar to Jim's, and she actually completely made her commitment back to government as being uh, something that can be of value and would help. And she spoke very strongly about the integration that is necessary, that communities, commerce and governments work together pulling together to find the solutions to the current problems that we're facing <coughs> with climate instability. So she was not against government, it was just one comment that was taken out of context. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> I just want to, because she did say all that afterwards <laughs> in, in response. Um, just a simple one. How, how far from Exeter is Yeah, well, um, we're quite open to the idea that Exeter isn't just like a little contained bubble where people don't interact with it from outside areas. Obviously, it's a market town and it's got connections to other places on the outskirts. So when we talk about the community of Exeter, it can be, you know, you could view that as quite an untangible thing. Um, to give you a specific answer, <laughs> we're, we've kind of been saying that about 15 miles around Exeter, but that's, I suppose that's a general idea rather than a concrete rule. And if, if we were to... Um, if there were any projects that presented themselves to us which we felt were kind of outside of our uh, sphere, then I guess we would look to try and work with other community organisations in that local area and see if we can help them to develop their own projects. And just to show you the flexibility, I've been saying 20 miles. <laughs> <laughs> We've just time for one more question. Do you consider non route solutions We, we certainly would consider it. Um, I mean, I think we're wanting to do something that is not offensive to the public, but there are things that are ground-mounted, and we are we have been in talks with Devon County, County Council about a big project that might be happening, and that would not be rude. So, I think probably the, the most important thing is um, the ground of roofing is, is set important, but it's more to do with where there's an energy requirement. So we don't want to do a standalone system in a field that's not connected to anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there's a, an energy requirement and they can't go on the roof, but it can go next to it, yeah. and it's not going to be offensive to anyone, then it, it, that energy 
It's one of the conversations that we've had with um, the churches, because they've got some, some land sometimes that is, that is close to a community centre. Well, the church, I mean, it has a huge land bank, yeah. I believe land. Yes. So would you say it's okay? It's, it's one of the conversations that has started and will be continuing. And, and um, we've had to put on hold some of our investigation with Bruce while we've been all, while Joe and I've been organising the big community energy weekend. And now, I mean, we've enjoyed that, although it's been quite stretching. Um, but once that is in the past, uh, that will free up our time and energy to go right back into all these possibilities about Bruce. So thank you all for coming. Do enjoy the rest of the uh, energy fair. There's 15 installers, advisors and suppliers uh, ready to answer your questions. There's a cafe serving lovely food next door and children's activities start again at 2 o'clock. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.